morning, everybody. Uh, super glad to be here. Just want to start to say how much I love you all. You guys don't even know. <laughs> my schedule's been very busy the last couple weeks, and I was thinking maybe I wouldn't make it, and then I thought, no, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so I'm calling this the second renaissance. I got a bunch of stuff in the jump in. Who's seen this thing before? It is here. There we go, right? So 100 years ago, these uh, sponge divers off the coast of Italy came up, and they came up screaming, and they said they saw arms and legs down there, and they found all these interesting statues. And this was one of the things amongst the wreck, amongst the wreckage, and it took a long time for people to figure out what it, what it is. They had to have not just astronomers, but they had to have mechanical folks get involved, people who were good at making clocks and that sort of thing, to kind of piece together what this thing is. Um, this thing is a mechanical, analog, astronomical computer. And I would argue that this disrupts the timeline of Western technology by about two millennia. Right? Something like this doesn't show up in the West for you know, quite some time later. So in my, in my search of trying to understand uh, computers and AI, I have sort of ended up way back at the, sort of the beginning of time, so to speak. And I come across stuff like this all the time. And I get really confused because I thought that uh, magnetic cryptological machines were from the last century, not from 1,500 years ago or, or before that. And so this idea of the first renaissance, you know, what was that all about? It was people realized that the folks that were around before them were onto some really good ideas that had maybe gotten lost or forgotten. And I think that we're going to discover a second renaissance, that the people who were before us have also, in between those times, have come up with some really, really interesting things. So everybody, astronomers are aware of this Goldilocks principle in sort of where the planets can live from the sun. You don't want to be too hot, you don't want to be too cold. But there's an idea of this in psychology, too, that we try to understand the world, that sort of not the parts that's too hot, not the parts that's too cold, but sort of what fits in with our understanding of things. And so I've been trying to think, if we were to sort of just randomly find some of these artifacts, what would we think of them, right? If we were to try to discover, and we see these things, would we think it's a necklace or maybe a decorative outfit? How would we possibly understand that this was sort of a um, you know, data structure? This one here, you know, uh, that the Polynesians used to, to navigate the, uh, the currents, it's extraordinary. And if I came across that, I don't think I would immediately recognize that as sort of this analog computer type system. You know, if we were to come across Leibniz and you were about to see his binary numbers and stuff, would we recognize how big a deal uh, that was going to be? Uh, this reminds me of Tom in your book and uh, Don when we went through it. You know, these. Uh, I wish we had had this. I think you had pictures like it. But this was a, a 3D thing that Maxwell sent to Gibbs to try to understand uh, these, these these relationships. I think that's a cool sort of physical model. So I came across this woodcut. This is uh, arithmetica, the sort of personification of arithmetic. And what we see down here is a sort of those two schools. Uh, that I think bifurcated and has caused a lot of this sort of confusion about why we don't understand this, this past as well as we do. Um, we're the best we could. And it's the idea of sort of doing this um, numerals and this sort of Arabic manipulations on the things that we learned in school versus sort of the abacus, right? They still teach it in the East and the kids get really good at it. They get so good at it, they use an abacus and they file and they just kind of do it with their hands. And uh, you remember you know, learning Roman numerals in school, but they kind of lied to you because what they didn't tell you is the Romans had abacus. And they, it wasn't just that they had this V and the five and all this other kind of stuff. They actually had a very efficient little, little sort of mechanical kind of thing for calculating these kind of things. Uh, here's sort of a calculating tablecloth, right? You can imagine this is where checkerboards and, and chess games come from. But look at this. I mean, 1177, you know, sort of reckoning and sort of doing these calculations on paper, these are algorithms, right? This is computer science kind of stuff long before anyone thought about it. Uh, here we have sort of a uh, just arithmetic organ, you know, this is 1620, it's sort of calculating clocks, which is pretty cool. So we have this tree of analog, it was really great to go over as a student and get a tour of the analog uh, facility, and there's sort of a, a great analog culture here at Gilhurst, that's my travel with seeing other people, no one's ever heard of it. So we got operational amplifiers down here, I remember in all the labs at Rex, we sort of got our hands dirty with those, and that was, that was super <laughs> fun. Uh, here we have Vanny Barbush, and he has his uh, mechanical differential analyzer, this is a class of things that uh, I'm concerned are not taught anywhere in the world. They're way too old to be taught in any sort of computer science training kind of program, and they're way too new to be covered by any history curriculum. And I would argue some of the most important technological developments of the last 100 years, or even the last millennium, are just not included in our education system, at least not outside of Gilbert. And they're sort of saying put up a whole side of the room. So then they started to look, look sort of like machines like this. And then people study little queen model, more complicated things. Uh, so <laughs> as you go through your MATLAB and your Python and you think your debugging is, is complicated, imagine working with these. I mean, I, I can't imagine. Like, how did they really get that kind of stuff running? 
And there were and there were literally bugs in it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So they fire these things up and they try to get it to recognize patterns. And um, you know, here we got the von Neumann uh, with Oppenheimer. He says, "I'm thinking about something more important than bombs." Uh, we're very proud. We have four students now at Los Alamos from our lab, and um, they're working. You know, back here. So this is actually from '98, and this guy Hans Norvac, and he says, "When we get this computer power, we should start simulating these things." We have that kind of computer power now, or we can kind of. Uh, you know, for, for a small price, we can try to simulate like a small animal or something like that. And so this is a, another sort of uh, field that sort of dropped off the map. I'm not quite sure why. I think a lot of these things, I call them victims of their own success. These are the kind of technologies that run like, you know, anti-aircraft guns and stuff like that. So it doesn't, doesn't really make it into the mainstream somehow. But the folks that work on it, they, they think it's kind of a big deal. Um, all right, so I just want to jump into this thing that's, that's really neat uh, about reprogramming. I don't want to spend too much time on this. But you can, you can take these images and you can sort of, with these uh, computer vision systems, you can trick them easily in ways that humans aren't tricked, or maybe we are. And I think that's the interesting thing. Um, so you can take this little bit of noise and you can mess up the stop signs. You can actually put some stickers and stuff in there. And that would throw off the Tesla, right? No, no one here would be confused, but that would mess up your cell phone. Um, and then you can actually get these things to do tasks they've never done before. So if you have a system that you know, knows can sort out cats and dogs, you actually get it to count by doing this really weird, peculiar uh, border around it, and you've actually gotten this system to do something it was never programmed to do before. You're essentially you know, brainwashing it, getting it to do something else. And so this gets into this idea of info hazard. Sort of a, these are sort of noxious signals uh, to the system, and we want to think about that. Do humans, are we susceptible to this kind of a thing? So there's, there's a, a, a few books that sort of have this theme. Uh, Neil Stephenson is the one actually coined the term metaverse, and he's got this amazing book called Snow Crash. And in there, there's this sort of virtual reality uh, signal. It's not quite clear, is it a drug? Is it a software program? Uh, what is it? They sort of trade it around, and it crashes people. When, they, when programmers see this, it sort of messes them up. That's a lethal pattern. But only programmers, because they know binary, right? That's the story. Um, and at first, I thought that was just like such a silly kind of plot thing. But now, I'm like, wait a minute. These neural networks were designed as models of real brains, so maybe, maybe so. And there's another amazing story I want to I pitch here. This one's uh, Babel 17. Uh, and this is a code breaker. They try to break this code, but then they find it's a language, and uh, this language changes your mind as you learn it. Uh, and there's another one, very similar theme, this idea of a macroscope. You know, so seeing, seeing the bigger picture can almost sort of be lethal to your, your understanding of things if you see too much. Well, this is what the Tower of Babel was, sort of getting too close, and God said, hang on a minute, you're climbing up too tall. And uh, <laughs> sends it back down into a confusion. So that confusion uh, showed up in the Middle Ages in something called the dancing plague, which was really wild. So sort of a, a noxious signal for humans is, I imagine what, I don't, I don't know if I want to hear the tune or not want to hear the tune, but these people danced to their death, some of them. It went on for maybe a month or so, and just out of physical exhaustion, a lot of them didn't make, that, make it through that. Uh, it's not quite clear why that happened, how this sort of spontaneous group behavior just emerged, and it's sort of contagious, it's a really strange kind of thing. Uh, it was thought that music could cure a tarantula bite, and so they had this, this weird you know, con conflation, or at least how we try to understand it now, of, of what was happening in terms of music and medicine. And um, the last story here is this voyage to Ferromito, which is sort of about a, a synthetic intelligence that communicates in music. This is one of the more interesting ideas I've, I've ever come across, and I'm surprised I've not seen it more places. So in trying to understand why that was a thing or wasn't a thing, I came across this language from the 19th century called Soul Ray Soul. And uh, if anybody's more musical than I am, I'm not very musical. So that's what's kind of fun for me is like a physics because I don't know anything about music. Um, and you can you, you write this language. There's only about 6,000 words or so in this language, but you write them all out of the soul pitch here. So you have seven characters in the alphabet. And uh, the alphabet is basically just one through seven, but also the do, re, mi. And each one gives a color. It gets a position in the scale. It gets a glyph. And so this language is sort of very multimodal, right? You get hand gestures in it. It's kind of like the... Uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, with the, you know, when, they, uh, when they're talking to the spaceship, you might represent the movie way back. And so this language, um, you can represent it, you can sort of speak it, it's sort of like a, a Latin kind of thing. You could say, uh, do re, do mi la, do sol re sol, which means I speak sol re sol. Uh, don't ask me to say anything else, please. Um, <laughs> and um, I just think this is fascinating in terms of brain representation. I want to be able to think in music. I want to be able to work through physics problems in, in tones and things like that. Uh, I think English, we have a lot of sort of stops and just fricative sound and sharp noises. Oh, look, there's a bit of thinking. Um, <coughs> so you can write this as sort of this weird alien script. You can write it as just these punch cards, and then you can write it as a sequence of colors, or even as a string of numbers, right? And so I think, you know, now we gotta listen to these radio telescopes and see, is this, 
maybe these kinds of things, what these languages look like, uh, if we get a string of numbers, uh, what is it, it going to be? Um, so they actually, uh, somebody produced this sort of color piano where they tried to uh, you know, create these sort of rotating glasses, glass light, sort of just a, a description of what it might look like later. But they talked about this color music and it came to this lost language of paradise, you know, sort of Tower of Babel kind of theme again coming up. And so I was shocked to see that that sort of a piano that plays colors is that old, but where are they? Why can't I buy one of these on Amazon? Why is this not mm -hmm. a thing? I was shocked on that. Um, if you asked me when the first electric instrument was invented, I would not have said 1759. So I was just shocked to see that we had electrical instruments that early. Uh, here we've got a mechanical um, a hydraulic computer. So here these folks, they pump the water on the side to build up a steady pressure to, uh, to run that thing there. Let me just read up here. Uh, they've got this automatic organ sort of stuff dancing around. Where does this complexity come from? I would have thought that this kind of mechanical and intellectual sophistication was, was much more recent. Um, and so I'm just shocked to see all these things. This sort of looks like a data structure that looks like a MATLAB array to me. Um, here we have you know, cryptographic music. So music not just to have a signal, but an encoded signal. And that's sort of like in the beginning. Do we know what we're looking at? We assume that the ancient world was sort of simpler than us, but maybe it was more sophisticated in this sort of thing. So we've got these sort of neural networks. And just this idea of uh, you know universal music, music of the spheres, language of the birds. I think we're going to get back to this, and um, I think we're going to need a synthesis of a lot of these different subjects. And so that's what I'm calling the second Renaissance. Here's just, I wrote a short story that's kind of along this theme. It's at legaltech.ai if you want to check that out. And uh, thank you so much. It's been a great honor. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> complex for now and I'll be at lunch and love to chat with folks. Uh, a few years ago, Gilbert went through a, the, the late unpleasantness where we're just about week six, the liberal arts. 